production with an emphasis on self-management and democratic management of economic institutions within a market or some form of decentralized planned social economy and blah, 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 so forth and so forth. Sorry, I have just been reading you the Wikipedia entry on democratic socialism, which is full of abstraction and endless terms, each of which you could have an extremely, extremely long argument about the definition of. I think perhaps a better starting place for understanding socialism is to just look at the world around you. I'm here in New Orleans, Louisiana, on one of my favorite streets, Esplanade Avenue, at the bottom of the French Quarter. Now, the mansions that line this street are hundreds of years old, and they are absolutely gorgeous inside. This street feels like paradise to me. If you walk through the French Quarter in the middle of the night, though, you're going to see a lot of homeless people sleeping on the stoops and in the doorways. New Orleans, in addition to being one of the most beautiful places in the country, is also one of the most unequal. And you have people sleeping on the streets outside the gates of gorgeous, gorgeous old houses. And here's something even worse. Many of those lovely properties, they're not even occupied. They're divided into luxury condos and held as investments. The owners never visit, they're just places to store money. Perfectly functional homes, but built to the highest standard and not a soul inside. Now, you see that all over the country. New York City has far more empty apartments and condos than it has homeless people. And the root of socialist politics is looking at a situation like that and being disturbed. Terry Eagleton said that a socialist is just somebody who is unable to get over his or her astonishment that most people who have lived and died have spent lives of wretched, fruitless, unremitting toil. And perhaps that's a little over the top, although actually uh, most people who have ever lived may have died horribly during childhood. Uh, but the point Eagleton is making is that being a socialist starts with being deeply, deeply disturbed by other people's pain. Not accepting the conditions that allow some people to die of preventable disease while others live in opulence. The socialist is the one who looks at GoFundMe campaigns for insulin and instead of thinking, ah, how heartwarming to see people helping each other out, instead thinks, there's a serious, serious problem here when some people are having to beg others for money in order to stay alive. Now, of course, what people say in response here is something like, well, we all believe that poverty is bad. Nobody disagrees. At first, I'm not actually sure that that's true. As San Francisco's homeless population has exploded, the wealthy liberals who dominate city politics haven't done a goddamn thing about it. In fact, they actively resist efforts to build shelters and new public housing. There's nothing to stop billionaires from giving their money away and building houses and letting people just live in those houses. But they choose not to, because they don't actually care about the lives of other human beings. Now, if you look at the suffering of other people, and you could do something about it, but you don't, then you don't really care very much about it. You hear a lot of excuses made for poverty. Oh, this is land of opportunity. If you just got a job and had a bit more grit, a bit more persistence, then of course you'd succeed. Um, but of course, giant numbers of people who live in poverty are children, single parents, disabled people, and, and so that doesn't really apply to them. But these excuses help you avoid having to feel bad when you see other people with extremely hard lives. So we have this one group of people who go, oh, well, of course, I care, I care so much, but then they don't actually do anything to suggest that they care. But there's another set of people, the 
bleeding heart libertarians will instantly snap back, and I'm sure you know, you know what's coming. Uh, free market, the greatest poverty reduction system in the history of the world. Poor people have iPhones now, etc., etc., etc. Now, there are a lot of problems with the empirical claims that are made. I mean, the countries that have been the most successful at getting out of poverty have often had the most government intervention in their economies. Um, many improvements in our lives are the fruit of publicly funded scientific research. And uh, you can have a much, much more generous welfare state than the United States has without hurting your uh, GDP or your economic dynamism. But we should also note how these arguments try to change the question. The question is not, has there been an explosion in our productive powers over the last several hundred years, which even Karl Marx uh, acknowledged. It's, is there currently preventable human suffering in the world, and how do we prevent it? So it is no answer to say, well, capitalism reduces poverty. Because regardless of, of whether we stand on what has happened, it certainly hasn't eliminated the poverty we see around us. It hasn't given insulin to the guy who died because his GoFundMe failed. Now, oftentimes defenders of the status quo they say things like, well, just look at the Middle Ages. Things are so much better now. But, I mean, you could have made that argument um, in the middle of the Great Depression. Uh, a feudal lord could have said to his peasants, well, uh, you are somewhat better off than you were last year. Um, but he still has enough wealth that he could make their lives much more bearable than they actually are. So, uh, to be a socialist is not to deny progress, but to be frustrated by the gap between what is right now and what could be. So we're, we're kind of people, we're people who believe in human potential. Now many conservatives, they look at human beings as sort of naturally selfish and violent and life is nasty, brutish and short. Now we on the left, we, we refuse to accept that. We don't believe that war is inevitable. Don't believe that miserable jobs are inevitable. Don't even believe climate change is inevitable. That's just the way things are. That doesn't satisfy us as an explanation. Why? Why must they be that way? Now, often things that we're told are impossible are not only quite conceivable, but they've already been successfully implemented around the world. I mean, if you take healthcare, for example, uh, we on the left have been advocating recently in the United States for replacing private insurance with a single payer healthcare system that would, uh, instead of paying uh, premiums to a for profit insurance company, you'd pay taxes and everyone would be covered. Now, plenty of other countries do this already, and it works abs it just works absolutely fine. Um, in the United States, however, in the, our political discourse, it is treated as a complete impossibility. It would plunge the economy into Venezuela-style disasters. So, basic things that other countries already have and do very well and would not give up, things like paid family leave, things like robust protection on your ability to join a union, they're absent here. Now, I think... I think people too often get hung up on questions like, um, are the Nordic countries socialist, or are they, uh, are they kind of regulated, managed capitalism, or are they social democracy versus democratic socialism? I think the real serious question, the more important question that we ask is, well, what do people deserve that they could have, but they don't have? Now, we socialists think that your value is not tied to your earning potential, and that every life, every single human life, deserves to be a good life, and could be a good life if we cared enough to do something about it. Now, socialists spend, we spend a lot of time talking about workers, uh, and that's for a very simple reason, because 
workplaces are a domain where people uh, often, <laughs> well, they live lives pretty indistinguishable from authoritarian tyrannies in many ways. And uh, it's where most of our waking hours are spent. Now, you know, sure, you know, if, if, if your workplace is tyrannical, you could leave your job, but you might also be able to flee a country that had a tyrannical ruler. Um, and many people can't afford to lose their job, so they're therefore stuck working for bosses who exploit or harass or manipulate them. Now, we socialists have always argued that workplaces are happier and more productive when employees have rights, when they get to control the company themselves rather than simply serving the interests of owners who often, and I mean, this sounds like an overstatement, but it isn't really, they don't care. Owners don't care whether their workers live or die. They don't care what the human consequences of mass layoffs are because it's not what they're thinking about. Now, I want to talk to you about the democratic and democratic socialism because it's extremely, extremely important, right? We all know that there were plenty of brutal regimes in the 20th century that called themselves socialists. They use that word. Um, democratic socialists, libertarian socialists, they want to preserve the important core principle of egalitarianism uh, while at the same time ensuring that democracy and free speech are protected. So just to be clear, we detest quote-unquote socialist governments that don't actually follow the principle of worker control. When North Korea calls itself socialist, just as how it calls itself democratic, it isn't because the principles aren't being upheld. We are strongly committed not just to enhancing the economic situation of the worst off, but in protecting everybody's basic liberties. Socialist thinking is popular in the United States. Uh, public polling shows that people are responding very well to the term right now. They're realizing that we are not nearly as crazy as we're made out to be. I mean, in fact, it seems kind of strange that there should even be a debate about whether it's acceptable to have people negotiating with insurance companies as they die with cancer, or sleeping on the streets while mansions sit empty, or constantly worried about being fired if they don't keep speeding up their work over and over and over. And the reason that people have been drawn, for example, to the Bernie Sanders campaign or the Democratic Socialists of America is that those are the only people in the country right now who seem to have the right amount of outrage at things that really, really should be outrageous. I want to go through just a few things that people are probably going to start screaming at me in the comments section, because God knows that every single time you say the word socialism, you instantly get accused of being economically and historically illiterate and all kinds of other things. Okay, so, thing one, uh, someone might say, well, being entitled to something like medical treatments implies that I am entitled to a doctor's labor and they're a slave who must perform a service whenever it's demanded of them. Uh, that's just not, it's just not how it works. Um, doctors aren't slaves under Medicare for all uh, or a democratic socialist system any more than, I mean, we already have public sector employees. We have teachers, um, we have librarians, we have soldiers uh, in, in the country today. We, you, we don't force people to take jobs. We pay them to take the jobs. Uh, people are compensated. They do it voluntarily. Uh, a right to health care doesn't actually you know, override another, a right to, another person's right to freedom. I mean, if you couldn't find any doctors willing to do the job, then, then you wouldn't be able to satisfy people's right to health care. Um, fortunately, uh, doctors do actually want to help people, which is why uh, in countries with single-payer health systems, you have doctors and they're not slaves. So generally, if you pay them, they'll do the job. Oh God, please help me. My house is on fire and my children are trapped on the upper floor. You've got to go help them. Oh, sure. You expect me to drop whatever pornography I'm looking at and help you 
just because your home's on fire, lives are at risk, and I've been trained and equipped to do it at public expense after a shared democratic decision to put resources into it. Uh... So I'm just a slave to you? What happened to my American freedom rights? Is this worse than Nazi Germany? I'm just asking questions. Never mind. They died. I accept your apology. Thing number two, someone might say. Someone might say, well, free medical treatment, housing, college, these all sound wonderful. But somebody has to pay for it. These things are expensive and taxes will increase. Now, an important point here is that we have to remember in these discussions, because it's often kind of um, people try to fudge this, is that when you pay for a thing, you are getting a thing in for your money. You're, you can't look at the costs without also looking at the benefits that you get, right? So, for example, take single-payer health insurance. People look at the price tag for it, but they don't look at the fact that it saves money. It saves you money, it saves me money, because you don't have this giant private for-profit health insurance bureaucracy wrangling over every treatment. So, investment into public research, that pays off in the form of the discoveries that are then made. Giant public investment in green energy pays off in the form of not having the entire planet ruined. But there's also a sense in which we, we shouldn't even really think in these terms of, you know, what's the return on our money, because some things are still worth paying for because they're just the right and decent thing to do. Um, if I help my neighbor out at some cost to myself, I do it because I care about them um, and not because it's saving me money necessarily. Um, so we should spend money on giving sick people medicine because they're sick, because they're suffering, because we want them not to have to worry about their medical bills while they're sick. So the next, next thing someone might say is taxation is just theft. You're, you're, you're stealing from people to give to other people. Now, I, an important point here is, you know, I don't really care, honestly, that much about the philosophical argument over whether taxation is or is not theft, um, because the better question is whether it's justified, okay? So if your children are starving and you have no money, uh, of course, you'd be justified to steal bread for them. Um, I'm, I'm not a property rights absolutist. I mean, I believe that people should get to have things and, and comfort and you shouldn't take those things away from them. Um, but once you've got a house, food, transport, healthcare, entertainment, everything you could reasonably possibly want, if you're sitting on this giant pile of extra wealth that could be put to much, much, much better use and you just don't care enough about other people to do it, I don't really have that many qualms about using bits of that giant pile to give children good schools, right? So, yeah, I mean, if you get too redistributive, you, you can harm growth, um, but that's sort of a pragmatic concern rather than a principled one. I can't believe I have to pay taxes for universal health care. I don't care to. I worked hard to earn this money by hiring an attorney to buy the patent rights for a life-saving drug and raising the price by 9 billion percent. This is robbery. From whence it came, huh? <laughs> Someone might also say, they might say, well, we've tried the kinds of programs that the Democratic Socialists are currently advocating. Why don't you look at the VA? Why don't you look at the public schools? Why don't you look at the public housing? And given the atrocious, in many cases, track record of these programs, why should we expect anything but bloated, dysfunctional, bureaucratic boondoggles? Now, I think it's very important for everyone on the left to acknowledge that there are badly run public institutions. Um, there are also badly run private institutions, but there are also really well run public institutions. Just because a thing is public doesn't mean it has to be dysfunctional. Uh, our public universities in the United States are really, I mean, they are absolutely world class. People come from all over the world to learn here. Uh, public libraries, they're beloved institutions. Uh, around the world, there are examples of really good public schools, really good public housing developments. The absence of market competition, now it does eliminate one means of making an organization run effectively. Um, but there are plenty of government entities that do well. Medicare is extremely popular already, for instance. Now, someone might say to me, well, I say, um, 
incentives. Incentives. Once a person is entitled, once they have an entitlement to free food, free healthcare, free housing, free college, why would they bother to work? Um, and I think the notion that people would stop working the moment their just basic needs have been met, um, it's easily disproved. Uh, first, when we just think about wealthy people who uh, have all they need and yet continue to work, many of them quite excessively. Um, people need this sense of purpose and fulfillment in their lives, they need something to do, and uh, work is one place that many individuals uh, find that. Um, in countries with generous welfare states, you don't actually see everyone, you know, in, in the Nordic countries, for instance, you see less work, but it's because people have more opportunity to relax, and that's good. I mean, an all-consuming obsession with work is not necessarily a bad thing. It gives people more time for hobbies, for spending time with their friends and family, uh, for raising their children, for pursuing their passions and interests. These are good things. We should actually want to reduce the amount of work in people's lives. Okay, let me address the, the V word which comes up in every single one of these conversations. Someone will ask me, how has socialism worked out for Venezuela? Um, now, this is a very important point. Proponents of democracy understand, as I say, that when North Korea says the Democratic People's Republic of Korea doesn't, in fact, discredit democracy because it's not actually democratic. So when people call Venezuela socialist, it's important to ask what they actually mean. Now, if it simply means um, a large state sector, um, there, there are countries that have very large state sectors that have not ended up like Venezuela. Norway would be mostly socialist if that's, if that's our criterion. Okay. But if socialism means the expansion of democracy in the electoral realm and the workplace, then Venezuela, like the former Soviet Union, like China, uh, is self-evidently just, it just doesn't satisfy the criteria of being socialist because it doesn't have those things. Um, the Wall Street Journal had, had one of its Venezuela reporters um, go there and he acknowledged that there was essentially nothing even beginning to resemble socialism in Venezuela. Um, we're not pushing for authoritarian economic mismanagement. Uh, we're pushing for things that we actually know work. We want to be very, very pragmatic about it. Okay, and so we established my new regime of exploiting the people and raping the land. Pretty great. Hold on there, Chief. Ripping off the public and destroying the environment? These are just the kind of things that the liberal media are going to spin against you. Oh, thank you. Kill all media? <laughs> Easy there, General. To make this nightmare smell sweeter, let's change the country's name. Instead of its actual name, how about uh, the extremely democratic... And handsome. And handsome Republic of Justice and Socialism and Freedom and Cat Memes. And everybody gets a husband. That's great. Thank you. You'll be taken seriously by shallow idiots in no time. My work here is done. Now everyone's going to throw a million more objections at me, I'm absolutely certain. But before you jump down my throat and start shouting the word Venezuela over and over, I'd like you to do the following. Actually read some socialist writings. Read the papers put out by the People's Policy Project. Read Jacobin. Read Current Affairs. Or attend a meeting of your local DSA. Don't reflexively assume that we are naive, or that we haven't thought about your objection, hear us out. Democratic socialists, we're smart, they're decent people, they're working to build a better world for everyone. Whew. Take one. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs>